evening, ladies and gentlemen. Have your attention, please. Children! <laughs> it is uh, with, with great pleasure that I introduce to you tonight Dr. Ronald Zachary, the president of uh, Valdosta State University. And I've, I asked him if he would uh, give me a bio so I could talk about his art, because when you look on the internet, you just find all these other things that he does. That, but all the art stuff's sort of missing. And he said, no, just, just tell them who I am. They kind of know me, and it'd be OK. <laughs> but I was at Lowndes Middle School last week, and um, Becky Young, who was here, had a student in class, a sixth grade student, who had come down here to the center and seen some of Dr. Zachary's work and had kept a journal he gave it to her English teacher, I believe, is that right? That's right. And the English teacher shared it back with Becky. And I was in the classroom, the girl was in the classroom, and since I was there and I read this, I said, do you mind if I use this for Dr. Zachary's introduction? She said, let's ask the girl. So the young lady said I could. So with, I keep in mind, this is, a sixth, <laughs> this is a sixth grade girl, OK? By the way, this is uh, being brought to you tonight by the Turner Center and the Southern Artists League. I wanted to put a plug in for our group. I'm the president of the Southern Artists League this year, and anybody that has any interest in art that would like to join our group, it's very cheap. You're more than welcome. We have membership boards. We take money. Yeah. This statement was written by a sixth grade girl at Louds Middle School. My favorite artist is Arnold Zacharoff. <laughs> He owns BSU. <laughs> One of his pieces, it always catches my eye. Arnold's just so unique, it's like he gets the thoughts of a child. <laughs> That's why kids can enjoy his work. And with that, Dr. <laughs> I have to tell you, Stephen, that's the most unique introduction of my professional career. I'm honored. Thank you. You came to hear about the spirit of art tonight. And one of the difficulties, I didn't prepare my demonstration and some thoughts tonight for this number of individuals. So what I'm going to try to do is, is make it understood way back there as I show you some of the work. There's um, a couple of goals that I have in mind this evening. I want to talk to you about the spirit of art. And I really want you to, to get in the soul of Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> and, and later I want you to, to ask some probing questions. I want to sort of share with you how we have come to this particular day and the meaning of uh, each morning. Uh, I want you to wake up with me in the morning and go through a typical day and understand um, what goes on in my head and the rest of this tall, thin body and how we try to communicate with one another throughout the day. And I want to start with a quote from one of my very favorite artists. Uh, uh, Picasso. This is um, a quote, 1934, and he asked the question, what is an artist? His response, a collector. A collector who wants to build a collection by making the pictures of what he has seen and liked elsewhere. That's the way to begin. And then it turns into something else. Now follow that. You think about all the experiences that you've had in a lifetime. You get those locked into your mind. And you store those that really are beautiful and meaningful to you. And then you turn them into something else. Well, that's kind of what I do each day. Now as I approach the university after spending about three hours in the studio each day. And some of the professors in this room will tell you, I don't have as much control over the university. <laughs> 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 
in terms of turning it into something else <coughs> and creating some new aspects. Although, I must share with you this evening the incredible support from the faculty, staff, and students, and members of the community as Valdosta State goes through not only a cultural transformation, but a physical transformation, because you will see well over a hundred million dollars worth of construction going on at any one point over the next five to eight to ten years. As one project comes to completion, there will be another in its place. And so it is a work of art that is constantly under change and transformation. So I want you to keep in mind as we talk this evening about why I am a collector. Notice I did say I was an artist. I'm saying I am a collector. The definition of artist is only in your response. There's a, there are a couple of other quotes that are very meaningful. They are from Picasso as well. And he said, at the beginning of each work, there is something working with me, and near the end, there is the impression I've been working with a collaborator. So as I talk to my work each day, and I think about where it's moving, I really have this collaboration, whether it's with a latex mold or with wax or with bronze or with metal, there's always this constant dialogue. Picasso once said, sometimes there is a face so sensitive that I can have a visual dialogue with the head just as though I'm having a verbal dialogue with a real one. Now, think about the sensitivity to a cold piece of metal where the artist can have this discussion and have this closeness. And that is what I seek each day in my studio. Let me give you a quick example. One morning, with the, the cover of a magazine torn off the front, with a exacto blade cut out, a piece of <coughs> cardboard flat. Took it to Voigt Steel Fabrication Plant right off Warnto Road, and took a digital photograph of the flat piece of paper did the math coordinates and all the points, plugged it into the computer, put it onto a plasma cutter, which is sort of looks like a pencil, but it's very, very hot, obviously. You can cut a piece of metal like butter. And by taking the flat piece of steel that was cut from the plasma cutter and putting in pneumatic rollers, you now have a piece of metal that came from a very spontaneous cut, a piece of paper in the studio. If you were to drive on the golf course behind my home, you will see one of these that is seven feet high, cut in three pieces and mathematically stable enough that even in the heaviest winds, sitting on only three points, it will not move very far. It may just kind of sway a little bit in the wind. Spontaneous dialogue with a piece of paper. How do I know it's going from flat to curvilinear and three dimension and, and actually could uh, make that as, as high as I wanted, as, as, as much as the piece of steel could handle in terms of size. Another front piece of a magazine cut in a very spontaneous way. And as you look over to the stainless piece over here, and the important part of that stainless piece is the shadow formation against the wall. It is called Windbird, and the important part of that piece is it's, uh, it's made to function and sway in the wind. So when the wind hits it, if I can pull this over here, for those of you on the back, it's made to have ball bearings in the piece, and as the wind hits it, it, it flows in the wind. Now this was a model 
done for a home in Naples, Florida, and an outdoor pool made of stainless steel will never rust. And the actual finished piece is eight feet from here to here, so it's a very mammoth piece of stainless. <clears throat> but you can imagine in this very ultra modern house on the beach, it has, has this wonderful flow to it. So this was made as a model to market the piece for people it was designed. So coming from a small piece of paper to this, to a moving piece of sculpture that has eight feet in dimension. I want to thank a, a few people here before I talk a little bit about how I became a collector. I obviously want to thank uh, Stephen and um, the Southern um, Art League for having me here this evening. And obviously I need to say thanks to everyone at the Turner Center for the Arts. Everyone has been so fabulous as I went through the process of the last 18 months putting this exhibition together. And also need to, to thank the people at uh, Classic Frame Shop. The team there really came together. I was framing probably, as you most of you do, about two days before the opening of the exhibition. <laughs> and uh, Carla Penny said, uh, we're not going to frame one more piece for you if you come back here. But I'm going to quit. And of course, Nancy uh, always does a tremendous job. My wife, uh, she helped put the entire show together. She really has a knack for putting pieces together and displaying and I would say this looks good here. She said, no Zach, you can't just go away and then I'll <laughs> <laughs> Alright, how did uh, how did I become a collector of images? I want to take you back to my childhood. Someone told me, wow, you can really draw well. And I never thought much about it. I just thought it was something I enjoyed doing. And I went into uh, Cub Scout. And I looked down the list of activities. And you had to do the projects. And of course, it said, do art. Make points as a Cub Scout. And I said, wow, that, that sounds great. And he said, uh, you could do wood carving. That was my first venture into doing a piece of sculpture as a Cub Scout. And when I presented this piece of sculpture, it happened to be a camel, by the way. <laughs> and I thought it was rather poorly done, but people thought it was, it was well done. And from that particular moment, and I always go back to scouting as, as some place where all this started, the, the small world that I was in became the very beautiful world small word of A-R-T. And from that moment when I presented that little carved wooden cam to the Cub Scout troop, art became the most important word in my life. Now some interesting things happened as a result of my love for, for mm. art. <coughs> as you surmised, I come from an Italian background. Grew up in western Pennsylvania. All of my family, um, especially grandfathers and grandmothers on both sides, migrated from Italy. Um, one set from Sicily and another set from Naples. So I had this, this wonderful heritage of two, two sections of Italy. And they were all in the grocery business. When I came over here, I got in the grocery business. So I was expected to follow the trends of the family. And sort of, we, we had little neighborhood groceries and then we had supermarkets spread around. So it was like when you go into training and you want to make the pros, you, you go down into the miners. Well, that's kind of what I did. I, my family and I ran a small neighborhood grocery store and I would go home at night, study in the back of the store and then do all of the shelving, put all of the produce up and canned goods and get ready for the next day. So, so I, I had a full-time job, even as an elementary youngster, of working in the market. So I was supposed to graduate from high school, and the supermarket that I was to take over and manage was about 27 miles from my home. But the expectation was that was my store, and I was being groomed to do it. 
But when I made the announcement that I incorporated the Z theory into the family business. Now, what's the Z theory? <laughs> Typical art person. When people expect you to zig, <laughs> who's that? So when I announced that I was going to the university to study art, there was a great disappointment that went throughout the Italian family. Now you have to understand, every weekend was a ritual where I went to both grandparents' house. And we ate pasta and we, did, and we had about 15 courses. You can tell that I really took the <laughs> But we had this, this wonderful weekend of, of, um, of interaction and spirit. And I wasn't supposed to be leaving any of that to study art. My father's wish, as he said, if you're not going into the family business, you're going to Notre Dame, you're going to study law, and you're going to become an FBI agent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and truly, that, that, was, that was his goal for me. And I didn't know quite what to do about it. I had a larger Italian family pushing me to the business world. I had a father who wanted me to do something that I wasn't interested in. So I did the Zag. And I left right after high school graduation, two weeks after high school graduation, with 16 of my friends who went to Pittsburgh and joined the Air Force. And I was gone from home within six weeks. And basically, uh, never to return to the family and to the business. After uh, three years in the Air Force, I decided it was time for me to pursue my dream. Now, an interesting thing happened to me in the service. I met um, a very talented young lieutenant, a musician. He was a drummer. And he actually, you remember Bill Haley in the comments, walk around the clock? <laughs> he was Bill Haley's drummer. And he was about ready to leave in six months, and he was playing with a local rock group, and they were having a difficult time finding a drummer. And I said, well, I had studied classical piano back in <laughs> Pittsburgh. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll sell you my set of drums for $35. I'll give you six months' worth of lessons, and you can take over when I live. So I took them up on them. <laughs> the whole time I was in the service, I played drums two or three nights a week, traveled all over the countryside as much as the Air Force would permit. So when I went to the university, I announced, should I study music? Should I study visual arts? And guess what? I was on a basketball scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, gee, I really would like to be a basketball coach. So I thought the best thing for me to do is play basketball, study some music and study some art the first year to see just which way I wanted to go with this thing. And I took uh, a couple of, uh, of visual arts courses and the head, of the head of the art department sat down with me one day and said, look, you really need to pursue a career in visual arts. And so I went back to my love and Cub Scout day and the fact that I, I think I was on the right track. Um, I did that and became a, a young assistant professor, and Nancy and I were married. The first year that I was an assistant professor, uh, and you're going to believe this, but my nine-month salary was $4,850. $4,850. We had two children. I was on a nine-month contract and had no money in the summer. So Nancy and I stretched these little canvas and I had acrylic paint back then, and we stretched as far as we could by mixing dirt and, and sand in <laughs> And did these little paintings with flowers, and we'd take them to summer uh, projects along the beaches. And I have, had a van, a little Ford van, 
And we'd sell these for $25, $30 along the roadside, and that's how we really got through the first year as a young assistant professor. Now, they don't pay me much more at Valdosta. <laughs> <laughs> but you have the admiration of the faculty. <laughs> they want now you understand why I'm still making art. <laughs> Trying to supplement my income. All right, back, back, back to the art. So now you have a little bit of background about father's wishes and where we are. Went off to um, Penn State University to do a doctoral study. And I went to Penn State University after looking across the United States for the right university because I wanted to go off into another direction. Uh, I'm sure you're thinking at this point, I can't make up my mind really what I want to do, but it's a, there's a system here. I wanted to study anthropology because <laughs> it had a, a tremendous amount of, of contemporary theory about the way people analyze things his, historically and how anthropologists go into a strange environment and start mm -hmm. isolating all the structures and make sense out of it. And I said, I want to do a dissertation, I want to do my research and help people think creatively. How do artists go through this process of an idea to an end product? What goes on in between? I devoted three years of research seeking a solution to that question. And I will tell you that being at Penn State University was the most magnificent time in any, any young person's career and it's when I was introduced to the textbook called The Hidden Order of Art. It's by an author, Anton Ehrenschweig, and I want to read one quote to you <coughs> as we begin to look at how the artists create. He said, in any creative search, whether for a new image or idea, involves the scrutiny of an office, an often astronomical number of possibilities. Now, when I worked with my young students in the studio at the university, especially freshmen coming out of high school, they would say, um, we don't know what to draw. What, what do you get ideas? And I'm thinking about the hidden order of art, the astronomical possibilities. So how could a student not have these thousands of ideas bouncing off and going in different directions. So we really wanted to take a look at, at answering the question from incipient state to finished product, what happens in between. Every morning as I approached my studio, I was there at uh, four minutes after four a.m. this morning, uh, working on some new pieces. I like to get about three hours in the studio before going to the university each day. And I do that because it really starts a day of, of uh, innovation.